Okay, good morning. My name is Tyler Muffley. I'm a urogynecologist at Denver Health in Denver, Colorado. Um, today I'm going to be um, talking to your class about evaluation of urinary incontinence or prolapse and evidence-based critique and um, just wanted to say thanks for having me so much. Um, I do not have any financial disclosures. This is the OBGYN department at Denver Health and we have um, a lot of fantastic faculty and I wanted to thank them for the opportunity to give you this talk as well. And so at the conclusion of the talk, we should be able to review the epidemiology of incontinence prolapse, summarize um, office evaluation techniques that you can, that you can do um, yourself and um, appraise their utility and evaluate the validity of urodynamics findings. So, okay, so urinary incontinence affects um, over 17 million people a year. More pads were sold in the U.S. last year for urinary incontinence than for menses. We're talking about a silver tsunami of patients here where um, they frequently um, have suffered in silence for a long time uh, about the leaking when they cough or laugh or sneeze. The, this is quite costly. We're talking $26 billion. And it's not just the cost of pads. It's the lost work. It's the um, depression that's associated with uh, an agoraphobia because patients aren't going out anymore. It's not just changing from regular aerobics to water aerobics. It has significant mental health issues um, where we know that patients with incontinence have poor body image and high rates of depression physically functioning. The way I got into urogynecology was a patient had um, uh, leaked on her way to the bathroom and fallen on the urine um, and broken her hip and uh, that's what she was there for broken hip but what got me interested was the um, was the rest of the problem was the urinary incontinence and then we know that about 20 to 40 percent of women in midlife and beyond have some sort of incontinence and the only thing that's harder to get people to talk about than urinary incontinence is fecal or flatal incontinence looking at prolapse we know that about 16 percent of women have prolapse and then uh, the lifetime prevalence is about 30 to 50 percent um, and this Olson number is an old number we know that now one in six women um, I think that's 18 percent of women in their lifetime will have surgery for prolapse or incontinence by the time that they're 80 and these surgeries are not perfect so you're going to see a lot of patients back um, the surgeries get you know about a B minus C plus in terms of efficacy and so when we're talking to patients about surgery we have to explain that this may not be the last prolapse surgery that you get in your lifetime and we have to be open and honest about that so we're going to do a couple quizzes here um, throughout true or false the women's preventative services initiative recommends that doctors screen women of all ages for urinary incontinence yearly by using a questionnaire absolutely true so we know that um, urinary incontinence is recommended for screening and um, that patients um, oftentimes do not uh, bring up this topic on their own. True. Okay. All right. So we know that as women age, this uh, prolapse and incontinence surgery gets more prevalent. We know that, let's say, a woman has two vaginal deliveries. At the time of vaginal delivery, the muscles and nerves in the pelvis are stretched or injured or denervated. Um, and so at that time, we then see um, other muscles and nerves compensate until they reach um, middle and late stages of their life where um, these other muscles and nerves can't compensate anymore. And so the patient starts to 
um, have prolapse or they start to leak. So um, age is a risk factor in, a, in and of itself. Race is a risk factor. Um, we know that white women are at the highest risk of um, prolapse and incontinence. We also um, know that vaginal parity or vaginal number of vaginal deliveries is the number one risk factor. So um, things that are demonstrated by this slide. So what, what kind of tools do we have? Well, of course, history and physical. We definitely want to ask patients, do you leak urine when you cough or laugh or sneeze? Um, do you have to rush to the toilet? Um, do you leak on the way to the bathroom? When you hear the sound of running water, does that make you feel like you have to go to the bathroom? Um, and do you see or feel a bulge in the vagina? Um, on physical examination, prolapse and incontinence is a clinical diagnosis, so um, oftentimes we'll have the patient cough and bear down. And you can see a little tic-tac-toe grid in a lot of the notes that um, we'll write, and that's called a pop cue, and it's a staging system that's utilized for um, uh, staging of prolapse, and it allows for um, comparison between different um, different systems and different institutions, different surgeons themselves. So just like fetal heart tracing has category one, two, and three, prolapse um, has stage zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, avoiding diary. So avoiding diary is very helpful because um, oftentimes we'll, um, at least in the state of Colorado, everybody has a uh, hydro flask or a Nalgene bottle or some sort of bladder irritant near at their bedside or on their day-to-day -day basis. And so maybe you find out that the patient loves Red Bull and vodka, and I just can't compete with that. Maybe the patient doesn't drink one cup of coffee a day. Maybe they drink one super big gulp size coffee a day. And so um, this is always very helpful. Uh, to do. We do it for three days and it's something that we can mail to the patients ahead of time and then have them bring back to us. Um, a urine culture, I'm sorry, a post void residual, um, always very helpful and uh, we have an ultrasound machine and if in your office you don't have an ultrasound that can do post void residuals, um, I would just wait until they get to see the urogynecologist. Um, an elevated post void residual could mean several things and um, it points us more towards a neurogenic bladder or a bladder that um, maybe a patient has a neurologic disease or uncontrolled diabetes where they cannot sense their bladder. A stress test, this is a cough stress test where we uh, gently separate the labia and have the patient cough and we're able to visualize the urethra and if any urine comes out of that urethra. Q-tip test, we no longer do this, but you'll see this in the literature where we used to um, put a Q-tip into the urethra and then have the patient cough or laugh or sneeze and um, that would, uh, we would measure the angle with a protractor here to see the angle of declination wasn't shown to be super helpful um, and that we can just do an eyeball test for this. These tests on the right, Euroflow, uh, single channel systemetrogram, multi-channel urodynamics and cystoscopy, these are things that are gonna be done in a urogynecologist's office and not necessarily part of the initial workup, but when you get your notes back, you may see these, um, these results coming back to you. So we'll chat about them briefly. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what our goal of our evaluation is trying to match the signs with the symptoms that we're trying to attempt to see if um, the patient's history matches the patient's physical findings. And we really want to pay attention to the patient's symptoms and treat what bothers them the most. So they're not bothered at all by their stress urinary incontinence, I can't fix that. 
uh, you know, there's no reason to fix that. If they're not bothered by going to the bathroom 15 times a day, then so be it. So, um, but if they're much more bothered by their um, stress incontinence rather than their urgency incontinence, then we're going to probably tackle the stress incontinence first. Oops. Okay. Okay. All right, so if you have to remember one slide from this talk today, this would probably be it. So the stress, urgency, mixed, and overflow slide. So stress incontinence is if put my, my bladder here, let's say this is the patient's bladder, and this is the urethra, and there's a pubo-urethral ligament that holds up the bladder and the urethra, so when the patient coughs or laughs or sneezes, this ligament allows for the urethra to kink off and not to leak. But after having, let's say, a vaginal delivery, a forceps delivery, a um, menopause, hysterectomy, um, being white, being a female baggage handler at Denver International Airport, that this, that this um, ligament is broken and, and so when the patient coughs, instead of having this solid support, it the uh, urethra opens and empties, okay? So leaking occurs. So coughing, sneezing, laughing, exercise, position change, all these things increase the intra-abdominal pressure, and that gets um, sent to the bladder. And when that happens, um, the bladder pressure exceeds the urethral pressure, and the patient leaks urine. Urge. Okay, so again, our model here, bladder, urethra, there's a detrusor muscle that's all around the, the bladder and that muscle squeezes urine and it allows the urine to be squeezed out of the urethra. And so when we sit down on the toilet, um, pull down our pants, sit down on the toilet or in a socially acceptable setting, to, to urinate, the detrusor squeezes and that makes the urine exit the bladder. The problem with urging continence is that the bladder is squeezing all the time and so it's making um, the patient feel like she has to rush to the toilet. So even when there's a couple drops of urine in the bladder, the bladder starts squeezing. When the patient um, drinks uh, a super big gulp of coffee, their bladder starts squeezing because of the caffeine, because of the tannins that are irritants, and um, you know, I'm not trying to um, shame anyone with their coffee or Diet Coke, for goodness sakes, um, consumption, but um, these are all bladder irritants. If you don't have frequency or urgency, then it's not a problem. So um, the normal number of times that um, patients with free access can go to the bathroom each day is between 8 and 12, okay? And so we know that um, residents, nurses, nurse practitioners, um, doctors, uh, teachers, that they're all um, holding their urine for long periods of time. And so this this urge can also happen at night and that's what nocturia is and that's by definition two or greater voids per night okay and then um, mixed mixed is both the urge and the stress and that's um, that's the question that we're asking is which is worse and then overflow this is a um, more unique more rare um, item but Think of it like water in the spillway over a dam where the patient um, ends up leaking because they have, um, they can't feel their bladder. So the bladder gets more and more and more full with urine and then just leaks over the top of the, um, the bladder into the urethra and falls out. So this might be because the nerves around the bladder are damaged from diabetes and so the bladder can't squeeze or can't sense. It might be a neurologic disease um, like MS or Parkinson's um, or some other cause. So 
this is this really leads to high um, post void residuals um, 200 300 400 um, or greater milliliters so something to um, to check for with a post void residual ultrasound so um, we're going to focus really on the patient's main symptoms, how long has she had the problem for, what makes her leak, how many pads is she wearing each day, how many incontinent episodes does she have each day. There's several um, validated quality of life tools um, that are very, very helpful and <clears throat> you can utilize these in your practice. Hormonal status, we know that um, lack of estrogen leads to poor quality tissue in the pelvis, and so um, the ligaments and nerves and muscles are not working quite as well. Um, neurologic disorders like we spoke about, medications. So um, if a patient is taking Lasix or hyd hydrochlorothiazide, oftentimes um, they're, they may be overwhelming their bladder with the amount of fluid that their kidneys are making. And so we need to be cognizant of what times of day that the patient is taking that, um, that Lasix. Ideally, the time of day that you would want to take Lasix is around 2 p.m., 1400, so that um, the patient, because Lasix lasts six hours, the half-life is six hours, just like Macrobid is BID dosing, so there's some creative minds there in um, the pharmacology industry with the naming of these. But if you take the Lasix at 2 p.m. at 1400, then the patient will void out the majority of their fluid in um, the afternoon and early evening, and then um, and have an empty bladder um, and be able to fill up more with the fluids in their body when when they're laying flat the heart does not have to pump against gravity and so more blood flow gets to the kidneys and so that's why when you're laying down for long periods of time like in bed uh, my kids would say they're rotting um, when they're laying down on the couch um, or when you're swimming and your body is flat in the water that your kidneys are going to make more urine. Okay. The problem is, is that the urinary symptoms do not always um, mimic the conditions of what's going on. Okay, um, So we oftentimes see that, um, that the bladder is a poor historian, that um, when the patient describes what's going on and then we do some urodynamics testing that we see a disconnect when she says hey I leak when I cough, laugh, sneeze um, what can actually be happening is that the bladder is triggering a detrusor overactivity and that's causing the patient to leak so um, there's not great kappa or sensitivity specificity for these diagnoses and so when you have a patient who's failing a therapy, you might want to um, interrogate the bladder a little bit more with a cough stress test um, plus a urodynamics. Okay, so we talked about the three-day voiding diary. I can't compete with um, Dutch Bros or Starbucks or Duncan that. Uh, you know, the patient, if the patient has uh, a love for bladder irritants, I'm not going to be able to compete. So we have a thirst mechanism for a reason. Let's use it. <laughs> um, and I, so there's a lot of people out there who say, hey, I drink a ton of fluid because it's really supposed to be good for me. And the reality is, is that um, a lot of that literature on on drinking water came from Weight Watchers where they said hey we are going to have the patient um, we're gonna have our members drink water rather than eat calories and that leads to better weight loss so um, oftentimes we'll have the patient keep a diary for three days with 
what type of fluids they're drinking, how much they're drinking. Um, we'll give them a, a hat that they can put in the toilet and have them measure their output. Really, we're looking for frequency greater than eight voids a day. Um, clinically, nocturia greater than zero voids a night. Like I said, the scientific definition is really greater than two voids a night. And, um, and so, um, in my practice, I seem to have a group of people who just has a love affair with Diet Coca-Cola. Um, and so, um, you know, we know that the tannins that give it that dark color for darker colas or, um, 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 red wine, that the tannins in the red wine and the colas are really big bladder irritants. Okay, so on physical exam, what we're going to be doing is looking for estrogen status. So if you have one of those ring forceps that has the fenestrated window, that has the window that you can look through, it's maybe about yay big. There was a great study um, by Whiteside and Barber, I believe, that showed that if you can see two um, rugae through that fenestrated window of the ring forcep, that that patient has adequate vaginal estrogen. We, you know, if you haven't seen um, a vagina that is postmenopausal, like an 80, 80 year old woman's vagina, oftentimes um, it's very the epithelium, not mucosa, because uh, the vagina doesn't secrete mucus, but the epithelium is very thin, that the epithelium is. Um, um, that it's very pale, that there's no rugae to be seen, and um, this this should be documented in your physical exam. Okay, the screening neuro exam. Urogynecologists, um, we're not rocket scientists or um, brain surgeons. You know, we're not doing rocket surgery here. But what you can see is that what we do want to test is. S234. So S234 keeps your PP off the floor. So that's what some of these um, netter drawings here are. You can see a sacral reflex where we're just taking a Q-tip and we're gently pressing it um, against the bulbocavernosus and we're looking for a contraction of the bulbocavernosus as well as the anal wink. And so what that shows us is that the S234 um, uh, nerve roots are intact and we can also test uh, S234 when we ask the patient to um, to do a Kegel to contract her elevator ani muscles so um, so we can ask the patient hey squeeze like you're stopping your flow of urine and when that um, if the patient can mount a Kegel then you can confirm that S234 are in fact intact Um, so, um, we also want to see if there's any anatomical defects like, um, prolapse. And so when the patient is, um, straining when she's coughing or sneezing or bearing down like she's having a baby, we'll want to check the pop cue. So the pop cue again is that little tic-tac-toe grid that will allow us to figure out the different types of um, prolapse and incontinence and stage those. Okay, so these are different types of prolapse that you may see. This is uterine prolapse. You can see here's the os of the, of the cervix. Here's the cervix. The uterus is in here, and then most of this is probably the bladder. Okay. Next, this is an anterior vaginal wall prolapse, and we can tell that it's anterior vaginal wall because um, we'll do a split speculum exam and we'll place half the speculum in um, posteriorly and hold down the rectum and then have the patient bear down and see anteriorly what's going on. And so that allows us to distinguish between anterior wall prolapse and posterior vaginal wall prolapse. And this last patient is post hysterectomy, and so she has had a vaginal vault prolapse. You can maybe 
um, make a guess that here's a dimple and maybe here's a dimple and those are usually the top of the vagina where it was suspended previously and then failed again. So pelvic organ prolapse usually not very subtle. Here's that tic-tac-toe grid um, just so you know the the top line is usually the anterior wall uh, and most of the time that's going to be bladder aka cystocele the bottom line is posterior vaginal wall that's going to be um, most of the time rectum aka rectocele the cervix or the cuff so this is the apex of the vagina D is the posterior fornix this is the distance between this is the um, let's see if we have a good picture we'll see if we can find a good picture but this is the um, deepest part of the vagina and so you go behind the cervix posteriorly there's um, a spot called the posterior fornix where um, where the peritoneum forms around genital hiatus is GH that's the opening from the urethra to um, to the posterior fourchette or the back wall of the vagina so if this is the vagina um, it would be from the urethra to the back wall of the vagina there. And there's more technical definitions for these things. But the perineal body is from that, um, from this part of the vagina, the back posterior, for, posterior fourchette down to the anus, to the middle of the anus. And then total vaginal length, here's a test question. Total vaginal length is the only measurement that's done not under strain. So all these other measurements, AA, BA, C, GH, PB, AP, BP, and D, these are all done while the patient, they're all measured with usually a little Q-tip with some um, centimeter gradations on it, and, um, and we can place it inside the vagina and measure, um, but total vaginal length is placed um, to the posterior uh, foreshed all the way to the posterior fornix. Okay, so pop cue. This um, this is the standard. So uh, please come and do a rotation with me if you have any desire to learn more about pop cue. But it really is, um, I think, since 1996 has been um, the uh, way to provide prescription precise descriptions of pelvic support um, and uh, allows surgeons to um, evaluate how stable their um, or progression of their prolapse. So um, these pictures always bother me because it's like you know, whose ungloved hands are these? I, I guess I assume that they're the patients but genital hiatus from the urethra to the posterior fourchette this would be an anterior wall prolapse where this is the bladder, this is the urethra, and then you can see that prolapse is basically like a hernia. Oftentimes people get hernias in their belly button or groin, but sometimes ladies get hernias in their vagina where the bladder is pushing down into the vagina and can bulge out beyond the, the hymen or the opening of the vagina. Perineal body, this is from the um, posterior foreshet down to the middle of the anus. And what's important about the perineal body is if the patients have multiple vaginal deliveries or an episiotomy or um, some sort of perineal tear that, that, that the perineum is where muscles such as the bulbocavernosus and deep and superficial transverse perineae come together and um, and hold um, the, the prolapse in place. Okay. So um, prolapse staging, so if stage zero is good, stage four is bad, basically um, negative numbers are good, meaning that, um, that the prolapse is above the hymen, and positive numbers are bad. So we're measuring everything from the hymen because that's a fixed point. And um, 
and everything is measured in centimeters or sonometers, depending on how you like to say it. So um, what we can see is um, stage two is the most common um, prolapse, and that is prolapse where it's at a centimeter um, above the hymen at zero, so the prolapse is at the hymen, or plus one when the prolapse is one centimeter beyond the hymen. Okay, so cough stress test. So um, during a pelvic exam with the patient in dorsal lithotomy position, um, if you have the patient cough, like the patient's coughing here, um, and you see urine leaking, that is a positive cough stress test. So um, that has a high sensitivity for stress urinary incontinence that will be found on urinary, on urodynamics. Um, so uh, you're in the splash zone, so be careful. Maybe have your thumb nearby so you can block the flow of urine um, and um, or have good reflexes. So um, I don't think that there's a, a better fluid to get splashed by in the body. Um, urine is mostly sterile. If you got splashed with urine, you wouldn't have to go get tested for um, blood-borne diseases. Um, so that's why we wear scrubs in clinic. So post-void residuals. We talked a little bit about post-void residuals that um, there's definitely a consensus that a post-void residual less than 50 milliliters, 50 cc's is normal. The problem gets to be what the upper level of a post-void residual should be. Um, we, we know that some NIH studies have used 200 milliliters um, of urine. Another study used 300 milliliters of urine. You can think of um, urine left inside the bladder as like oil in a crankcase, that it um, helps lubricate the bladder, and so it's normal to have a little bit of urine left inside. But um, the question gets to be how, how much is too much, and one elevated post-void residual does not make the diagnosis of urinary retention. This needs to be persistent. Okay, so post-void post residual, uh, which what is considered abnormal. So greater than 200 is pretty much considered abnormal. We talked about this Q-tip test, and this is a fancy protractor or goniometer. Um, and we used to, this was super uncomfortable, we put some lidocaine jelly inside the patient's urethra, put this Q-tip in. Um, in short, just don't do just don't do this, okay? It's, um, it's not predictive of the outcome, and you can look to see how the urethra bounces. So having the patient cough or, um, or bear down, you can, when she bears down, you can see, hey, the urethra is hypermobile because it goes down, and then when she relaxes, it comes back up. So take a look at the urethra. Urodynamics um, testing. So oftentimes, um, this is how it's done. You take a syringe, hook it to a red rubber, put it inside the bladder, fill the patient um, with uh, sterile saline or sterile water, um, and um, ask the patient to tell you when they first feel like they could give a urine sample, when they're feeling full, and then when they're have reached their maximum capacity where their eyeballs are floating because um, they can't take another drop where they would squat down on I-95 and um, pee in front of rush hour traffic and, and a police officer. So um, so this is, this is what we do. Um, first, we'll um, have the patient void. We'll catheterize the patient with the red rubber in order to get the um, post void residual, check that for your analysis because we don't want to um, we don't want to miss an infection and really that's the only requirement that I would have before you send a patient to 
urogynecology is that you've done in your analysis. Um, next, we'll be looking for when the patient feels like they're starting to um, feeling the, the fluid in their bladder, the first sensation, the maximum capacity when their bladder is super full. We'll have the patient cough and we'll see the meniscus of the fluid rise here. Normally, the fluid should rise and then immediately go down. But if the patient has um, detrusor overactivity, if the bladder is contracting so that it's holding um, when the patient coughs, if it's if the detrusor is holding the the bladder and squeezing it, then the meniscus on the fluid will go up and stay up for about 10 seconds. So, and then lastly, after we are have reached our capacity, we'll take out the catheter and have the patient cough. This is very, very simple, very easy. Um, you know, it's something that you can do in your own office for your own patients, and I would encourage you to, um, to consider doing it uh, because it takes all of five minutes and it can give you some, some good information. Are urodynamics really necessary? So um, a urodynamics machine let's see, is, has multiple catheters, one that goes inside the bladder, one that goes um, inside, uh, inside the vagina or inside the rectum. And with this, we can measure the, the pressures in the bladder, the pressures in the abdomen, and then subtract those two the, um, to get the detrusor pressure, or the pressure in the wall of the bladder itself to see if that's spasming. So, so this setup here that we were just showing, that is called single channel urodynamics. Um, and this multi-channel urodynamics, this is much more involved and requires a special chair. Um, and is something that we do in our office all the time, um, but is not something that you necessarily um, have to do for your, yours. So I want to be frank and honest with you saying that multi-channel urodynamics, um, all these indications are based on expert opinion, but um, these have been long-standing criteria when there's an uncertain diagnosis, when the patient uh, says that she leaks urine when she coughs or laughs or sneezes, but when we do a cough stress test in the office, we don't see anything. Maybe they've had prior surgery, um, maybe they have a complex medical history, um, maybe such as neurologic disease. Um, maybe if they failed a prior treatment, um, if they, are having surgery in a patient with prolapse beyond the hymen. Um, uh, all these things can be helpful for multi-channel urodynamics. Okay, so let's talk about how to fix this. So as opposed to diabetes or high blood pressure, um, you know, urogyne is nice because we can actually fix some of these things instead of managing them chronically long term. So first option for treatment is do nothing. The leaking urine is not, not cancer, it's not going to hurt you, it's not gonna shorten your life, but it really is very frustrating. Um, another option is avoiding coffee, soda, tea. You can get that on your bladder diary. Pelvic floor physical therapy. This is fantastic. This is, these are 99.9% .9 of them are women who are specially trained at the doctoral level um, to do pelvic floor physical therapy. And they're like a free agent with the amount of uh, competition there is to hire them because oftentimes they can strengthen the muscles um, or help relax other muscles. And um, a huge shout out to the pelvic floor physical therapy teams um, who are working um, who are working for for women with prolapse and incontinence um, 
Usually this is four to six visits uh, with a female physical therapist, like I mentioned, and um, they will work with um, work with the patients um, and usually send them home after a couple um, couple episodes, a uh, couple sessions to have them do some homework and do it on their own. The patient's going to need to do this for the rest of their life. Okay, so um, it's great to refer to pelvic floor physical therapy, and that is something that anyone can do, and um, the evaluation will be done. Next is a pessary, okay? So this is a pessary with a with an A on it. This is for Amy, and um, what it does is it um, pushes up on the urethra, so when the patient coughs or laughs or sneezes, it um, provides that extra support, kind of like a neo ligament, and it also pushes the um, bladder, rectum, and vagina up higher in the pelvis. So it can be used both for stress incontinence and for prolapse. Um, pessaries are kind of like diaphragms, you have to get them fit in the office. Um, there's tons of different sizes and shapes of pessaries. Um, the pessaries are um, inert. You do not have to remove them for an MRI or colonoscopy. Oftentimes patients can have sex with the pessary in place without any sort of difficulty. We do teach our patients how to remove, clean the pessary with soap and water, and then replace the pessary. Um, contraindications to pessary use are infection. So if there's a vaginitis, um, you should not be putting a foreign body into the vagina. So um, a pessary is great because um, it can be immediate therapy right, right here in the office and it should be a skill that every um, APP and urogynecologist should consider. Sorry, I had to get that. Um, um, the um, pessary is, um, how we fit it in the office is it really comes from the school of art rather than the school of science that we have to have the patient come in um, with an empty bladder and then um, usually we need to try two or three different types of pessaries. We have one of our um, uh, nurse practitioners, Jordan Bodie, who's like a pessary whisperer, who can seem to fit a pessary um, on the first try every time, which is an amazing skill. So, um, so our hope is that um, that the patient can go for a walk around the office, um, not feel any pinching, not feel any, um, any irritation, not even feel like the pessary is there. And so I explain it to patients like this is going, this is like going shopping for shoes that we want to find um, a couple pairs that fit nicely, uh, but once you have a nice pair of shoes on your feet, um, they shouldn't pinch or, or irritate you in any way. For patients who have urgency incontinence, um, oftentimes we'll try them on a medication. Um, the old standard used to be anticholinergic medications like oxybutynin, tolteridine, solifenacin, um, and they really all worked about the same. Um, and sometimes um, cause significant dry mouth or constipation that they are muscarinic receptor blockers and they were very non-selective for the bladder and um, we found over time that um, through three large random uh, observational trials that um, anticholinergics would lead to um, would lead to dementia, and so there's a position statement from the American Urogyne Society saying that mirabegron or a beta-3 agonist is a preferred um, treatment, and so um, patients with, um, with overactive bladder 
or greater than 65, we use the beta-3 agonist. And um, that is nice because the does not have any of the anticholinergic side effects, but it can raise blood pressure, and so we usually have the patient start that and then return to get their blood pressure checked. Okay, tibial nerve stimulation. So this is very interesting. So this is like an acupuncture needle that goes into the ankle right behind the medial malleolus, medial to the medial malleolus. And um, what it does is it allows us to um, uh, stimulate the tibial nerve, which is made out of S2, S3 nerve roots, and that goes all the way up to the bladder. And so we can have a patient come in once a week for 12 weeks in a row. Um, where they get 30 minutes of stimulation for each each visit um, and it's not uncomfortable it's not a bother but it is a um, it is a uh, uh, in your um, it is a tiny tiny needle so um, that's great for maybe retirees, maybe teachers on summer break, um, um, people who would prefer non-pharmacologic, non-surgical methods. Um, the maintenance for tibial nerve stimulation is usually about one visit per month afterwards. So it's an investment of time for sure. And then surgery. So, um, And so we'll talk about surgery here in a few moments. So quiz time. Pessary is recommended for urgency incontinence, stress incontinence, mixed incontinence. So they're recommended for stress incontinence, right? Perfect. You can use them in mixed incontinence, but they won't help with the urgency. Percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation is an intervention for urgency incontinence, stress incontinence, mixed incontinence. It's going to be for urgency incontinence, right? Fantastic. Okay, medications for incontinence. So we talked a little bit about this, but medications are used for urge incontinence commonly, and the anticholinergics are for patients who are less than 65 years old. Anticholinergics um, like oxybutynin and tolteridine are dirt cheap, and um, the immediate release versions can it can just cost uh, very few dollars, but um, they are oxybutynin 5 milligrams POTID um, and um, a different anticholinergic that's a prodrug with fewer dry mouth side effects is fesoteridine as well as um, any of the other um, um, anticholinergics with a quaternary amine. So really these beta-3 agonists, like I had mentioned before, are best. Um, Mirror and Abegron, you can start at a 25 milligram dose um, in the morning and then contraindication would be elevated blood pressure. Um, oftentimes we will give patients vaginal estrogen and that's for vaginal dryness or irritation. Um, it won't cure the incontinence, but it will make the tissue feel better. Okay, true or false, duloxetine can improve stress urinary incontinence symptoms. True, so um, duloxetine is approved in the UK for treatment of stress urinary incontinence, and so um, duloxetine is helpful because it, it um, adds more dopamine at onus nucleus and causes the urethra to be constricted more. Um, we're just taking advantage of one of the side effects of duloxetine, which is increased um, urethral tone and urinary retention um, in some patients. And so we're gonna take that, uh, those lemons and turn it into lemonade. Um, some of the excellent resources, uh, yourpelvicfloor.org. This is made by the International Urogyne Association and um, is just amazing. They um, have leaflets in 10 plus different languages about urogyne topics 
and they're all free and um, able to be downloaded and printed as PDFs. Um, incredibly helpful. Uh, you do not need to be a member to use them. Um, so yourpublicfloor.org and then you go to um, download leaflets and you can pick um, from vaginal hysterectomy to sacrocolpopexy to um, sling, um, uh, post-op instructions. Um, it's great. It's great. Okay, so in summary, um, I encourage you to match the symptoms to the signs of the urinary incontinence. Obtain a thorough history and physical. That would include a post void residual, water diary, cough stress test, and a pop Q. If you can't do any of those things, that's fine. Um, if you're going to refer the patient to your gynecologist, we will do those things. Um, we're going to treat the symptoms and determine what is most important to the patient. And we'll only do urodynamics if we're unsure of the incontinence type, the symptoms and signs don't match, they've had prior surgery, and if the results will change management. So um, this is what the referral to Urogynecology at Denver Health looks like right now, and then this is my cell phone number. Don't hesitate to call or to um, um, text, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. This is our department um, at Denver Health, and I'd like to thank each one of my partners for um, their help and assistance in um, taking care of urogynecology patients. And, um, and allowing me to pursue my passion. Thanks.